Fantastic. Well, welcome to First Wednesdays. It's August 4th, 2021. I'm Master Coach Gretchen Heido, and I am so happy to see all of you. I'm just happy to see all of you anyway, but I'm really happy to share our guest speaker, Kim O'Hara, with you. Um, I know that quite a few of you are very interested in writing a book. You've talked to me about it, or you have some ideas that you've been noodling around in your head, and you're a great writer. And so I'm glad that you came to this particular session tonight because Kim is fantastic. She is my book coach. And I got to tell you, you know, working with Kim has helped me to be able to get my story on the page. One of her real specialties is helping you take the story that you have inside of you and really get committed to getting it on paper. Um, I'd been working on my book, talking about my book, thinking about my book for years and years and years, and for at least five with the one that I'm working on with her. In 12 weeks, she took me from start to finish with the first draft, which I had not been able to do that like I'd write. And I had a lot of pages, a lot of pages of stuff. And she helped me create a system and make it cohesive and really get energized and excited about it. And she has this uncanny ability to get into your head and to partner with you in an excellent way that catches your vision and makes it bigger. So I am a huge fan of hers. And when she and I were talking, you know, she has this great, um, this great uh, program all about owning your own authorship, because it's really one of the key steps to becoming an author is making the choice and stepping into it. And so she's going to talk to us tonight, just really about all the things that it takes to get to start to finish, probably a little bit about her program, answer your questions and those sorts of things. And you're in good hands. You know, she's been in the movie industry. She has over 30 years of writing experience. She's written a book herself. She's taken a lot of her clients, um, well, most of our clients to the publishing line, and many of them have been bestsellers and that sort of thing. So Kim, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yay. Thank you so much. It's so, okay. so wonderful to be here and talk about one of like my favorite topic um, besides my children, which is books. And I you know, want you to think first for a minute about that one book that's changed your life. Just think about that one book for a minute. You know, if you want, throw it in the chat, throw the title in the chat, because I'm always looking for great books to read too. Because I know what that one book is for me. And if that person hadn't have written that book, there's actually things in my life that I wouldn't have aspired to do or changes I wouldn't have made. And so I want you to think about the book that you are considering writing. And then I want you to imagine all the people you're going to rip off from great life experiences by not taking the time to write that book. And then I want you to also think about why in the back of your mind, you're right now saying, well, Kim, I'm not like those people. Those people are best-selling authors that end up in Barnes and Noble. And I want you to ask yourself, why is that not you? And that's what we're really here to talk about today is the mental game that you have to get straight before you go for the gold with a book, because it's Olympic season. So excuse my, you know, metal metaphor, but writing a book from start to finish, going after a traditional publisher, promoting your book, you know, doing interviews, talking about it, dealing with any criticism that might come along requires a mindset that is un flappable. And a lot of people, oh yes, Badass by Jen Sincero. I have not read that one, but I've heard that that's like her whole series is really great. And she had a great story about being homeless in a car. And um, yeah, she's like definitely like, you know, tr you know, tragedy to triumph story. And those really resonate. Another thing I want to say too, is if you are thinking about writing a book right now, the climate is really powerful for mental health and wellness shock of shocks. We've all been through the ringer with COVID. We're going through another ringer soon with the Delta variant and publishers are looking for ways to help people mentally. Okay. So it's not so much like the best honey you could eat or the best scrub for your feet. It's like, how do we stay sane? <laughs> so they are looking for a lot of books with humor, like, you know, to balance out the wellness in your life. And so I'm seeing a lot of openings in the marketplace for those kinds of books and coaching, and like, like Gretchen was talking about systems, processes, uh, ways you can take people from A to Z and they can see a solution. You know, these are the kinds of books that I often work with 
with coaches and with people who own businesses. So what we're going to talk today about is like, I am not a fan of automated writing classes. I don't do anything that you pay money for. And then you get videos of me. I don't believe in like drop in and go to a castle and drink wine and write a book in the weekend. It never works. I don't believe in like airy fairy, like just write about like what's on your heart classes. They do not produce books. They're fun to like maybe play with your craft a little bit, but when it comes time to write a book, you actually have to do a process. And so the first process, like who here is actually thought about writing a book of this group? Great. So what I'd love you to put in the chat is how long from the first seed of thought that you received that you should write a book, how long has it been? And be totally honest, like how long have you had that first thought and then like been like, nah, and, oh, three years. Okay, great. From the, Michael, is that from the first thought or is that since you started thinking about more actionable steps? No, I'd say it was from the, from the first thought that like, oh, okay, I have something that I want to say. And I liked, it was just at the beginning of like me discovering that I like to write. Mm. Um, and then, and then thinking like, oh, okay. I was so inspired by the books I was reading at the time that I just got this jolt and I was just like, okay, someday I'm going to write a book. I just knew it. That's amazing. That's great. So good. Like people usually are around the five year mark tend to kind of come to me and throw in the towel and be like, I got this idea two or three years ago. It hasn't happened from the spark. And so um, hopefully we can get you er earlier than that. Um, Honor, on, is it Honor? Honor wrote a book when she was 12. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> what happened to it? Did you publish it? Oh, I have no idea where it is. I'm sure it's in some <laughs> recycle bin somewhere. Who knows? <laughs> right, exactly. Like I wrote a book on a typewriter and threw it away. So that was that was like something I had to recover from. But um, so we have lots of great. So we'll go back. We'll go back to the chat in a minute. I have a lot to talk about. Um, so I wanted to get to it. So because writing a book is a very emotional journey. OK, and part of what makes books great is your personal story. So there always has to be like that moment like that you knew that your life had changed or something had happened that shifted you because of X, Y, and Z. And you have to be willing to really vulnerably tell that story, even if that's not the version that ends up in the book, right? You have to be able to be willing to regurgitate that to me, to whoever you work with to write your book so that you can get it all out and not have any holds barred. And that is really difficult for people because what they wanna do is they wanna jump right to the system, the process, the solution, and they don't wanna really resonate with their reader yet about why they got to the place that they you know, landed on when they decided to write the book. And so a lot of the roadblocks I have with people are getting through that initial story and kind of like, I don't really know, does anybody really care? And what happens ironically is they'll write that story. And then from that story, another story they weren't telling me at all comes out. And I'm like, wait, what, what was that story? And they'll go, oh, that was just, I'll go, no, that's the, forget that story. That's the story. And they're like, oh my God. And then it ends up being the gateway to like this whole other through line that was bigger than you could have ever imagined. Because here's the thing, you're sitting there in your brain by yourself all day long, okay? That's limited. When you collaborate with other people, and I'm gonna get into some of these like mindsets that we have about collaboration, books are not Faulkner drinking whiskey in a coal mine anymore. They're very collaborative, right? We have opportunities to work together. And yes, it's gonna be you hammering on the computer, but collaboration is definitely one of the keys. I'm gonna get into that later. So I have this, these three keys that I've discovered. And Gretchen talked about my class, Own Your Authorship, which is this eight week class that talks about, goes deeper into these three keys. And I find that people that go through this process come out on the other side, rock solid, ready to write a best-selling book all the way till traditional publishing because they believe in it unflappingly. 
And these are the three keys that people that don't tend to, you know, do these, these steps kind of suffer when they get to the part of having to promote their book. They'll hide, they don't think it's great. And then it becomes a doorstopper. And it becomes one of those books you're like trying to give people for free at conferences. You know, you've had people try to give you those books. You're like, I don't, I don't, you know what? I'm good. I don't have any room in my bag. Cause you can just tell the book is like, it's like this thick. The cover's crappy and you're like, I, I, I just, I no, you keep it, you know? So we don't want any of you to write those books. So the first key, okay, is called the bigger message in the book. What is that why that you're doing what you're doing? And you have to stay out of the how. That is always what comes up. And I know why is like a buzzword with branding. But this is a very different way to approach the why. This goes to that story. What is that message that you want to tell people, right? What is that, like we were talking about Jen and Sarah, what is that like trauma to triumph story? Like, you know, there's, there's some like examples of people who like, I have a client, Andrea DeWitt, and she just signed with Penguin. And when she came to me, she had never written anything before, ever. She had been an educator, right? So she had written like academia, and she said, I just really want people to see that they can shift their mindset like I did when I was in crisis. I'm like, well, what's the crisis? And she said, oh, I don't know if that's the, the message or the bigger message. I said, well, what was it? And she said, well, we had this like financial thing that happened that really like flattened me and my, you know, like it really shook up the tree of everything. And I said, well, when that happened, like, what did you do? And when she wrote that story out and when we started to explore what her process was in changing her life from that big shakeup, we came up with name, claim and reframe, which is basically what she's based her book on. And it was such a hot sort of mantra or tag that she got picked up by a big publisher. But it was going from that bigger message that you name what situation you're in you claim a different way of behaving than you behaved before, and you rename who you're gonna be moving forward. And you can do it in little situations and you can do it in big situations. So um, like when Gretchen came to me with her book, Gretchen, is it okay if I say what your book's about? Gretchen had this book about secrets, right? And like people telling secrets and you know all of her experiences with all the different secrets that she's heard from women. And I said, well, really, what's our ultimate goal with this book, right? Aren't we getting them to like break their secrets? And then we were like, oh my God, it's like a secret breaking system. And we were like, yes, right? Which of course now I might make her change it. But um, no, it, it, <laughs> so that was like, so it's like always looking for something because they're at the end. And then she has to tell her story in that book. Well, like she disrobes in that book big time because how can she tell women to go tell their deepest secret if she's not doing it that would be like ridiculous so um so the bigger message in the book is you know really showing people how you believe your life experiences have changed you and you have the special secret sauce that you're going to lead people for them to change so if anybody has, like, does anybody off the top of their head have like a message that they think that they could quantify into like one sentence that they would want to give out into the world? Don't be shy. There's no right or wrong answer. Okay, go ahead, Jackie. Well, I'm trying to do a TED talk on abusive brain, the ABCs of abusive brain chatter, aware, believe, and challenge your core beliefs. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, so, so what's the, the story attached to your bigger message? The story is that abusive brain chatter um, holds us back. It held me back and it's what it, and, and uh, that we have to challenge it. We have to find a spiritual way to find a different voice. So you have to uh, be aware that you have chatter and, and that it's abusive, that it's like uh, emotional abuse. And B, you have to believe that inside of you is a voice that's more loving and kind. And C, you have to challenge your core beliefs because that's where your, your abusive brain chatter gets its ammunition. Mm -hmm. So that's- so, so, so why you? Because why, I- Why should you be the leader that tells us this, this, this story? 
because yeah. it's it, it was my it was my story it was like when i was 42 i finally had my aha the day the earth stood still moment where i suddenly just couldn't breathe any longer the chatter was so loud and i just hit my knees and i said i have to find a different way of thinking and i knew that i couldn't do it with my head so i had to find a spiritual path and that's what i did and then i now i'm helping others to do that well, that's wonderful. Yeah, that's great. As long as you have that evocative moment, right? And and it sounds like you literally fell to your knees. So that's yes. that's great versus like anybody else. How about you, Michael? Do you know yours? Are are you talking to this, Michael? Yes. You're the uh, only one that's fessed up to having a book that's named Michael. Um I don't have a one sentence thing I could throw at you, but it's, it's about, it's about what men go through when they become enmeshed with their mothers. Um, okay. And so, you know, without diving into too much personal detail here, it's something that I, I've had to overcome and the guys that I work with uh, have to overcome as well. And it's not something that has been written, it's been touched on in a book that's very popular with men, but mm -hmm. it was like a very, very small portion of it. I wanna take that and I wanna blow it up and make it specifically in the language that will appeal to, to men and then talk about solutions around that. That's amazing. So so you, you probably will have to tell that very uncomfortable story, that moment, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I already, you know, am willing to, to talk about it in depth and be super vulnerable about it. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. because I know that's the only way that, you know, it'll truly reach, uh, guys and have them identify with, with the, the subject matter. Oh yeah. And if you're offering solutions like, you know, better, better relationships with other partners, better work relationships, better sense of self, you know, better self-identification. Amazing. That's great. So, um, so, you know, you want to like, look at the profession, the topic, the experience, what you're going to bring out in the world and just really make sure that it's connected to that story that you're going to tell. And then you also want to make sure that you have an end game. That's definitely a solution. Like, where is that big O message taking you? Like, what are you going to, where are you going to leave people at the end of this? Like, and it doesn't have to be like, so much, right? It doesn't have to be the whole world changes. Sometimes the more like um, niche and kind of pinpointed you are opens you up to write more books. Because if someone buys your one book, they're going to buy your second book and your third book and your fourth book. So typically the people that are writers, they'll I can't think of any other analogy besides like, well, they, 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 they dump it all into the one book <clears throat> And then they're done and they don't have anywhere else to go. And I am a big, like, I believe in like teasing it out and teasing it out and teasing it out. So you can really take people as deeply as possible into the specific material. So, okay. So that's the bigger message. Like some, some solid whys that people have are like customers are suffering in your industry and you have a perfect solution because what you've tried and triumphed over or, you know, you see a new way of approaching life. A lot of people are down and out, which is what Jackie was talking about. And you're tired of people being taken advantage of. Um, a lot of people write books where there isn't really a message. And, um, you know, you really got to know what that core story is. You know, there's millions of people writing books, but there's just not that many people landing, it, landing them in a best-selling, really evocative way because they have not done this work and asked themselves, is this the best story I can tell? Is there a better story I can tell? Is this just the go-to story that everyone keeps telling me is the story or is there a deeper level story to this? Is there some other way that I can talk about this? And like, keep, keep digging. What I have people do as an exercise, you know, in your authorship, and I'll just tell you guys about it quickly here. Um, and we don't have time to go into it, but I have people write down 25 themes that they think are in their book 
And believe me, people think they have 20. They're like, I got, I, they're, they're, that is not a um, positive thing, by the way. You want three. That is it. And you want three so specific, okay? Like you want them to be so specific. It's ridiculous. Like it can't just be a broad book about recovery from divorce. That's not going to land. It has to be a book about recovery from a contentious divorce, recovery from a third divorce, recovery from divorce after a long marriage. Okay. If I, if I meet another person who stayed in a marriage for 25 years because of the kids, and now they're just a mess because they've never lived single and they're 55, they all need a book. I wish somebody would write a book for them because I meet them all the time. So I see all these like little, very specific, but people are afraid to write very specific because they're like, well, I don't know if I have enough to say about that. And it's like, if, you, if you've had that experience and you're a writer and you think you have a solution and you dig deep enough, you're gonna, you're gonna have 200 pages of a book. Like it's gonna happen if you're willing to open yourself up into that why and that bigger message. Okay, so then the, 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 the second key is your unique expertise, okay? So this is the special sauce that you're bringing to the table. No one has lived the life you've lived. No one has had the stories you've had. No one can tell the story like you can tell it. No one has the like viewpoint that you have. So I have a lot of people come to me and they're like, well, I don't know, like someone's already written a book about that. Like, I don't really know if if we need another book. And I'm like, but you know, they haven't, they aren't you. They haven't written a book from your point of view. They haven't written a book from your life experiences. And if a lot of people have written books about it and a lot of them are selling, then that means that we need more books on that because people aren't getting healed or they are, it isn't getting solved. So someone has to come in and ultimately solve it, right? And then, it's an, and then it's like a knock out of the park. Like I see that all the time. So you want to do it in a category where no one else is stepping up. So you wanna be really, really careful that even if you think, well, this is my experience. This is my why. This is my bigger message. And you go in and you really narrow down those three themes. You want to look one more time at the marketplace and just be sure that that's the angle you want to go out in because you're going to put a lot of work and a lot of time, months and months and months, draft after draft after draft into that book. And you don't want to find out in the middle of draft three, although when I work with people, we do find that we do discover things in the second draft. We do discover the book was actually about something else, which usually causes everybody to completely panic and go into like a catatonic state of depression. But then they discover it's the best thing that ever happened to them because it's like a rebirth, right? Because the book was done and then they thought it was the first draft and they go into the second draft and they're like, oh my God, this is like, this is horrible. We're going to have to rip this apart. And then they're like, oh my God, this is like more amazing than I ever thought. So you can't like know it all before you start a book, but you can be prepared for the fact that you might have some unexpected forks in the road because I'm going to just go woo woo just a tiny bit. Cause I'm not, I'm kind of a woo woo person, but I'm really a conservative practical person, but the book will tell you what it wants. It sounds crazy, but the book will tell you what it wants. The book will start having a voice. If you're clear in all these areas, it'll start waking you up in the middle of the night with stories. It'll start waking you up in the middle of the night with ideas. You'll, I tell all my clients, keep a post-it, keep notes in the car. One sentence can change and it oh my God, I never even, I forgot about, you know, that experience that I had, or I forgot about that guy I met in Vegas, or I forgot about that woman at that bus stop, or I forgot, I forgot about that person that said that. I mean, cause we can only remember so much, but when you open that gate to what you really want to write about, it all starts sort of flooding in. I have a coach, you know, a client, Angie, who actually coaches with Gretchen. Um, and she's writing a book that is like, it's like so simple and I can talk about it here because she posts on it on Instagram all the time, but it's a morning mindset, okay? It's really like the key to waking up and she talks about how she practiced this over and over 
And she's also had clients go through this process. So she has like, she has like evidence that it's working, right? And, and as she's taking me through this book and as we're writing this book, I'm like, I'm, I'm like, oh my God, this is like amazing stuff. How come nobody's ever come up with this? It's because nobody's ever come up with it because it's her unique expertise. And people discount that. They think, you know what? It's so simple. It can't possibly be good. Oh, I'm sorry. Does it have to be completely complicated and we have to procrastinate and justify for five years to make it good? No, it can actually be really simple and really amazing. So um, that's usually what comes with unique expertise. And, you know, there's someone that I know too who came to me and she was very upset because there isn't enough feminine uh, leadership in corporate. And she had witnessed this like really troubling uh, imbalance. And she has really the, the inside knowledge to how if corporations just allowed women leaders to actually lead the way women are supposed to lead versus women leading like men, we would actually be living in a far better world and we'd have a lot better corporate company culture. So that's a really big concept, but it's actually really simple. If you think about it, it's like, she writes about it, you're like, duh. Like <laughs> what her challenge is, is who's the audience, right? So that takes me to my next point. My next point is talking about your champion audience. When I ask people, who they think their book is for. I often get uh, 17 to 70. Everybody's going to love my book. And I'm like, no, that that's just the recipe for absolute disaster. And I get people to really hone in on like 30 to 47. Get those people and you will have a tribe that so believes in you that they will tell every other age group that you need. Think about, you know, when you go after like a, a daughter, like daughters, like their age, right? They'll tell their mothers about the books. And then the mothers will tell their friends about the books, right? But if you try to get the daughters and the mothers, that's marketing dollars you don't have. Okay, so when it comes time to market your book, you're going to have this tiny little pot of marketing money unless you're in a trust fund or independently wealthy. And that's amazing. I hope one of you is. But if you're not, you're going to have this tiny little bucket of money and you're going to have to throw it in one place first. And that's going to be your reader, right? And then you need them to be a champion for you. So how do you figure something like that out? How do you figure out your reader avatar? Well, you, you go for the age. You definitely want to look at whether it's male or female. You write differently for men than you do for women. It's just a different voice. And you also want to look at like, you know, what is their like, it, it, it's like, what is their profession? Like, what are their goals? Like, what is your, what are your readers? Like, are they motivated? Are they stuck? Like, are you trying to unstick people that are really down or are you trying to motivate people that are already on the up? Because that's really important to know. There's a level of people that have already gotten somewhere that are looking to go up more. And then there's the people that are like, I mean, this is like the first book they've ever read. Okay. So you have to think about Think about the first self-help. I can't even remember. I've read so many self-help books. I can't even remember the first self-help book I ever read, but I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was terrifying, right? Like I remember when I got into a little while into like relationship books, which I've abandoned since because they, because they just frightened me. The women are from Mars, men are from Venus book. Like I was like, oh my God, like, how do you even do half the stuff in this book? But that was very, very successful because of the time period that that book came out, there really wasn't this self-help wave, right? So it could be for everybody, right? Or like um, Pat Allen did how to get, how to get to I do, which gives you steps on how to get married, 
right? <laughs> like you're carrying this book around. Like you think it's like, good. it doesn't work by the way, but she sold so many of them. Again, a different time period where you could go really broad. You cannot go broad anymore. It's not going to work because the marketplace is so much more flooded with books. So you want to definitely look at where your, where your reader's at and where they want to go. Cause that's how you're going to be able to talk to them. You have to kind of know the, the, the conversation that you're willing to have with the reader and really what they can handle. And basically like, so you're looking at it and going, okay, so if I tell my story and I look at where I was at the entry point of my story, if the entry point of your story is like really rough shape, then you can't take people all the way to the moon in one book. You just can't, you're gonna lose them. You're gonna miss certain steps along the way, right? You're gonna, you're gonna not go deep enough into what they really need. And if you're willing to go deep enough into what they really need, like I said before, you're gonna write a second book. You're gonna be able to do material that deepens each chapter with courses and all kinds of ways that you can bring out the information, but you just wanna make sure that you don't go too, too fast with them. Um, I have a client who trains celebrities that are like, like old. So she trains like Jane Fonda, she trains like Lily Tomlin, right? And she's very, very, very clear with her exercises where these people are starting, okay? They're, they're already older, right? So everything she does is like a methodical step to understanding the primary goal. Yes, it's fitness. Yes, it's looking good, but it's like to not damage something, right? Because we just don't recover fast when we start to get into our 50s and our 60s and our 70s. You could break something getting out of the car, right? So you, she's very, very clear. She doesn't try and help people that are 40 or 30. They could take her stuff. She's great. But she also doesn't like try to throw every like exercise you could ever need. She just does a very simple, very simple. But then if people want more, they can sign up for her subscription program which is a year long, which changes up exercises every month. So the book was like the lighthouse. You wanna think about the book as the lighthouse. And then there's the beam that's going out that's showing them all the things that they can have that the book opened the door of, right? So that's why you gotta know like what your audience is looking at. Does anybody have any questions? I feel like I'm just like vomiting book material on a square. Does anybody have any questions? No, nothing, no questions at yeah, all. I'm going to add something to this, Kim. You know, you, you've said quite a bit here and it's such good stuff. And, you know, my experience with you um, has been all of these different things that you're saying. But coaches, something that I want you to think about of what she said with the type of reader, it's sort of like with the type of client that you might be looking for now. So is it mm -hmm. a first time? Is this the first time this person has ever received coaching? Are, are they in the... Um, rising phoenix in the middle of the ashes stage, or have they already risen? And we've talked a lot about that during these different first Wednesdays about who's your audience even for coaching? What kind of a person do you enjoy working with? It's the same when it comes to this sort of avatar for your book. So when you're thinking about the stage of life that they are in, where are they? You know, where are they emotionally? Where are they spiritually? What's the big awakening that they might be hoping for or benefit from, from reading your book at this stage in their life? Because it won't be for everybody. No one's book can be a, you know, one stage for everything type of thing, just like coaching. There's different types of coaches at different um, steps in a person's life, depending on what it is that they're going through. And your book's going to be the exact same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And I created own your author own your authorship is not for everyone. I have clients like you, Gretchen, and most of my private clients that sign on for a year and they just go from day one to publishing contract over the course of a year. But what I was finding was a lot of people were scared. They were in justification. They had all these excuses and the excuses were I'm in overwhelm. I don't know how to write. I don't have a master's degree in writing. 
I've never written anything before. Uh, what are my, what's my family going to say when the book comes out, which I always go, you mean the book you haven't written yet, by the way. Um, and, then, or, you know, just, just tons of like time. And then I say, add up all the time you've thought about writing a book, calculate that. And we probably could have already written an outline by now, right? Or add up all the time you've talked about writing a book or thought about writing a book, but haven't pulled the trigger on it. It's actually not, all those mindset things are really not what holds people back from writing a book. What holds people back from writing a book is they just don't say yes. It's really simple. Like they just don't go, yes, when, what, okay, let's go tomorrow. Yeah, and that's and it, so that's it. it. And it's the thing, Kim, too, where I talk a lot about, you know, intention with commitment. You can have an intention to write a book. I definitely had an intention to write a book. I've been writing different things since I was seven years old, but the Sturdy Little Secrets of Women book, you know, I had the intention for a good five years and I had done some different things. And I think that's the other trick of this too, is that a lot of times we think we are writing our book. We've written some things down. I had hundreds of pages when I came to you. So I really had been writing a book, but I didn't have the commitment in writing the book. So an intention without a commitment or a structure will get you nowhere except for the thoughts in your head. And then you go down the rabbit hole of, but if my dad reads that one part, now he's not that way anymore. And I really say this thing, will I have any clients? And, uh, you know, and all right. of these other things that get in the way. And so with this, it's really important that if you want something just like in anything else, you have to commit to it and have the structure. And a lot of times commitment means paying for it. It just does that we tend to care about things and pay attention to the things that we pay for. So if you really do have the commitment to writing a book, you know, charting a boat, whatever your thing might be, you have to put the money behind it. And then you have to create the structure around it to be able to. And the money is usually the thing that gets rid of the excuses, at mm -hmm. least for me, that if I have, uh, you know, invested a substantial amount, I am going to show up for that more than just, oh, it's this dream of mine. And I really think it would help people. That's the airy fairy stuff that Kim's talking about versus the logical, practical day in and day out. It does not matter how you feel. You know, I've had many things happen in writing with Kim, including like, you know, a flash flood where I almost died and whatever. She's like, that's good. I'm glad you're not dead. Did you write your chapter? And we keep writing, you know, and we keep writing. And that's just the way that it goes, you know. And so having someone who's not going to buy into your reasons, it's really, really helpful. So think about that for yourself. It's sort of like when your clients work with you because they want the thing, we have to get out of our own way and out of our own head of the reasons. Well, I can't because if I write the book, then I'm not really spending time with my family. And I can't because if I do that, I'm going to miss them growing up. These were my excuses, mm -hmm. you know, but it's just that it's excuses. It is. It is. And I, and I will say <clears throat> just to be totally vulnerable and totally transparent with the book that I wrote, um, which was about five years ago, I was really not as clear as I am today, the way I coach authors about their messaging and about having a game plan with that book, because you're going to want to stand behind that book and be like really, really visible all the time, or it's just going to be a box of 500 of them in your closet that you're going to be like giving away to friends or something, because my book was on recovery from sexual abuse and told in a way that I had not, I, I was on, I was on the mark where I couldn't find anything in the marketplace that wasn't like victimization or just, just, just get on to get on. I was like, no, where's the book where you talk about like how these things are all like the things that I did to survive are now all assets that I can use out in the world, strength and courage and tenacity and all these, you know, ways I turn myself around. But when I, came to promote the book, it was like what Gretchen was talking about. I was like, well, I'm not a sexual abuse counselor. I'm not a sexual abuse coach. Do I even want anybody to know I was sexually abused? You know, my, my coaching business is like taking off. Like, I don't want to not get businessmen and I don't want them to think this is just the like trauma. I don't want to be the trauma coach. So I actually landed a traditional publisher who did take the book out but I did not promote it at all. 
I put it on my website. I was like, oh yeah. And people would be like, this book is so good. Like, right. I was like, oh yeah, it, I, yeah, it's fine. Well, in December, I took the book back when my contract was up and I'm now sitting on it deciding, do I, how would I put it out now with what I'm teaching my clients? How would I put this book out and stand behind it? And part of it is it's my book and I stand behind it. That's actually the branding of my company. And actually has nothing to do with what it's about. It's just that I got to stand behind what I ask people to do. And I'm now doing the work on that book, it, that the own your authorship work that I learned through coaching my clients. So, you know, I'm like right here with you. I'm like a writer among writers too. There's no like, and that, and that gets me to these, these points that I just want to bring up um, and I want to leave a little bit of extra time to see if anybody wants me to like laser coach them on their idea or anything, but there's these shifts that need to be made in order to write a book. And the first one is, is creativity needs a container. It's sort of what Gretchen was talking about. It's like, Oh, like, I'm just going to take my journal and I'm going to go to like the waterfall and I'm going to write with like some sandwiches. No, it's never going to work. Actually, the more creative I was in the movie business, and I've written a lot of scripts, I've made 11 movies, and the way that I worked the best was when someone put me in like a storage locker with no food and no water and closed the door, and I produced material like that. When I was off like on a retreat or like with friends in Ojai, I came back like from a great drinking weekend, but I definitely did not have anything written. So you have to have like a container and structure. And that structure is actually very simple. It's just write a chapter every week, turn it in, write another chapter, turn it in, finish a draft, read it, start the next draft. It's like so basic, but like what happens in the spaces in between as you're writing or as you're being coached by someone like myself is really where a lot of the magic happens. And that's where you can have a little room to be, you know, that creativity and just have it flow. Um, oh, hi, Ellen. Um, what are your thoughts on this? My goal of writing a book is to get booked for speaking and raise visibility in the marketplace. Yes, I'm, you know, a lot of speakers have books. So again, it has to be a book that really supports that spotlight and really supports that like reach that you have with the book as like your mainstay. So if you, if your book is about too many things, then it's not going to land those speaking gigs. But if the book is very focused on what you can do several talks on, then that's amazing. I mean, I, pretty much all circuit speakers or anyone that really speaks has a book because it's, it's just expected that they're going to be, uh, be able to write a book, especially since they're able to get on stage and be great storytellers. Um, okay, so another one that I touched on before is writing books is collaborative. It's actually not solitary. Yes, you're the one that has to put your butt in the seat and deliver the 12 to 15 pages. But really, if you have like, a coach or like someone that you're, you know, accountable with, they are with you in collaboration. Go to Barnes and Noble and look at the back of a book and see how many people those authors thank. They have like 19 people reading the book. They have agents, they have coaches, they have managers, they have husbands, they have wives, they have the kids, like everybody. It's, it's a big it's a big process. Once you're done with like that third draft and you're like, I think I'm ready to actually show this to people. And I don't think people should show books to anybody until they have that third draft. But then you can go out to like beta readers and friends and show it to some of your target audience people and, and sort of find out like whether it's resonating and then you can make some tweaks. Um, Michael, did you have a question? Yeah. How do you go about choosing the picture on the cover? Because we all know that's the most important part. <laughs> right. If you get a schmaltzy, schmaltzy book cover, forget about it. Um, you don't want to put a picture of yourself on the cover if you're not famous, number one, because no one cares about you. 
um, you want to definitely work with a book designer. So uh, most of my clients, especially the self-publishing clients that will go to a company, like I'll send them to a company that I like, that's great at self-publishing and marketing. I have them hire a private book artist because typically those publishing companies will give you someone that's making these run of the mill, you know, person with a teardrop in the eye or like something dropping into a pond or like a ship cascading in the ocean. And you're just like, ah, they look like all the books. So you really actually want to throw some money and it does cost money at a good book cover. Unless you have someone in your family or someone in, you know, that you know, who like wants to help you out. And some of my clients do have like a very crafty 25 year old that like knows graphics. I've seen some like amazing book covers come out of like people that go to like friends and family, but you really do. So in, in terms of picking a cover again, like I have a talk, um, it's the person who did my cover and I've actually referred him to a couple other people. He actually does a talk. He was like, he's designed covers for like 25 New York times bestsellers. And he actually does a talk about picking that cover and like aligning the material that's in the book with the cover that you want to present for that audience. And like, what's going to trip up in their mind like recovery or solution or happiness or positivity, right? So, um, yeah, it, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I didn't know that there were specific book cover artists out there. So oh, yeah. If you, there's actually, um, there was this great article that I think I've saved the link. I can give it to Gretchen to share with the group. Like these top women, this was mostly for fiction. Someone did an expose on like that, that, that like a lot of covers are designed by women and it had like the top 15 women that had done these like fictional book covers. And so I just thought, well, I'm just going to call one of them and see if I can hire. They were like $25,000 for a book cover. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I charge too little, but like, it was like, it was crazy. I mean, they're really, they're artists there's artists. So you don't have to like, you can pay 750 to $1,000 for an amazing book cover. You don't have to go that far. And these people work for Simon and Schuster and they work for, you know, Hachette and they work for like big, big publishers that have those budgets. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an art. It's like tattooing. It's like an art. So um so the last thing I wanted to bring up was your ego because your ego wants to keep you safe and your ego is going to try to get you to, you know, kind of just maybe stay in the middle and not go too far on the other side with your book. And those books don't sell. So you want to go bold and go to the other side and you want to tell your ego, I'm fine. I'm safe. It's going to be okay. We're going to do this. We can always pull back. And that's the greatest thing about writing books. It's a long, like you're going to do it for a while. You're going to do it. Like you're going to be in the book writing process. If you do it properly, you'll be in the book writing process six to nine months. You've got plenty of time over six to nine months to have like a coming to Jesus moment where you're like, I don't want to put that in my book, like, and pull it out. And then you pull it out, but don't let your ego you know, get in, get in your way and start telling you like, you know, you're really like throwing too much at this book. Are you sure you should really be doing this? You know, maybe you should actually be following that career you had of being like a fine painter. Like that was so much more fun. Like, or is, is this is a hobby. Like, this is a hobby. You're not a writer. Like you don't have time for a hobby. Like I could go through all, I'm, I'm sure that Jackie could tell us about all the voices that we would hear in our head when we start to write a book, right? Like, cause then you've got all the voices you heard as a child. You've got all the voices of your first critic, right? There's that first critic that kind of embeds in the back of our brain that says like, what are you, what are you doing? Why would you even think of doing that, right? And so we've got to like excavate all those voices in order to go for it and really be strong as an author out into the marketplace. And that's really, what this talks about today, because all the other, you know, stuff, creating the outline and 
coming up with the scenes and coming up with the system and the process and what you're going to coach people through or what your experiences are for business. That's going to all just come in the process. I have this client, Alan Maxwell, and he was number three on the Wall Street Journal top 10 last year in this month in July. And we would have been number one if Alex Trebek hadn't have written his memoir and then died. So that was really like a bummer for us, but we still hit number three. But he was just a guy. He's just a guy out of San Diego. He owns a defense contracting company. And he wanted to write a book about going from Philadelphia rags to riches, right? And being in the Navy in between. And when we were done with like, and he had no, he had no, he was like, I'll tell whatever you want me to tell. Like he had no ego about it. And because he had no ego about it, when we got to the end, I said, you know, Alan, you've written a really great book. This is, I'm proud of you. This is great. But I don't think anybody cares. And he goes, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, you're not famous. I said, there's a lot of people that write books about the Navy. I said, you know, okay, like we factored in everything. I'm very honest, you're black. This is great, Black Lives Matter. We've got that, in, you know, that's in the pocket. Got all these things, but what is it about you? I said, you keep talking about these rules that you've had in Cuba and, you know, in Montego Bay and all these like the, 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 the battleship crashing and, and, and the, your team like trying to go around you and, and being almost court-martialed you go into all these like pockets of life, government, Philadelphia, Georgia, and you always figure out the system. And when you figure out the system, you go to the next system and you do even better in the next system. You've got like 15 rules. And he's like, I do. And I'm like, okay, go write them. He went and wrote them. We put them all through the book and boom, he hit Wall Street Journal. But if he hadn't have done that, if he had just been like, my books, find the way it is. And I'm going to be, you know, because that's the other ego, the ego that's like bravado, like, this is my story and I'm so great. Like, you need to have people sometimes say to you, it is, but it could be better. Like, let's just imagine if it's better. And he was willing to go, you know what? Because he learned to to he saw you want to get on the wall street journal top 10 you got to have something that those people have and so he was willing to go for it so i think i'm just gonna um end there i know we have six minutes left if anybody else has any other like questions or comments or want to ask anything about me as a writer or me as a coach um you can get in touch with me for own your authorship uh, you know, it's an eight week course. It's an application process that we do. There's a, like a sales page you go through, or if you just want to write a book for the whole kit and caboodle, Gretchen can give you my contact information. Um, so I'll just tell you that if you want to write down these things and ensure you're an author, you have to ask yourself, are you ready to unlock the power of your voice? Like, are you ready? like to unlock the whole power of it, or just if you're, if it's just a little of it, then you need to look at that. Are you willing to eliminate, eliminate every barrier? Just be like, nope, clean in the slate. I'm going to do this. And if there's barriers, then you have to like, look at them because they are going to come up for you. And are you willing to create an author vision? Are you willing to walk into Barnes and Noble or Amazon books and go that spot right there on the shelf? That's mine. Until you can do that, you will write a half-mast book. Right, Gretchen? Who's going to go to the New York Times bestseller list? Right? I am. Yeah, yeah. happening. It's already, ha it's already manifested. It's I already, already know where mine is in, in Barnes & Noble. Yes. <laughs> so coaches, who has some questions for Kim? Or some comments about what you heard today? Jackie. Uh, you could tell I unmuted there. Um, you know, I have a question. So, so the theme of, you know, you know, the theme of my book, but, but what really speaks to me more is a memoir that, that gets that, that combines that. Cause I, you know, I don't want to come across abusive brain chatter, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'd really rather, you know, just take people through, you know, and then, and I've come up with the theme, the, the bird, the bike and the suicide. 
And each of those three things in my life have been a life-changing moment. Um, so that's so. So the question is, is that so? So then, do you do your memoir? I mean, is a memoir different than a, a, a help book? Yes, you can't really combine if you're not famous. You, 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 your book will get your book will excel. Okay, so there are memoirs that get published by traditional publishers of people we might not know. And I've been on panels watching them speak at like the LA Book Fair or Frankfurt in Germany because I want to like, I want to know why are these not famous people's memoirs selling? And these people are brilliant writers. Mm -hmm. I mean, brilliant. Okay. So if you're not in a brilliant writing space, right, mm -hmm. then I would say moderate story trust that the, the stories you're going to put out might be two or three of them are enough to cement these ABCs. It's a, like it's an ABC, right? That you have for a topic that's really important. Andrea with name, claim and reframe, she has like four stories in her whole book. It's all about those experiences creating what other people can use to go out in the world and have a better life. So I would, I would tell people, if you want to write a memoir and you're not famous, you either have to have had something really insane happen to you, like really insane, which you'd probably already be kind of famous for anyway, <laughs> um, or go more towards business book, how to self-help and tell those really touching stories in the book. That's what I see, what I, what I see happening. So anybody, did that answer your question? And if you want to become a better memoirist, there are memoirist classes that you can take to become a better memoirist. I have like writing uh, peop, uh, teachers that are my, I refer people all the time to other writing teachers. I don't help, I don't teach people how to become better memoirists or necessarily like if they come to me and say, I want to write a memoir and they're already good writers, then I can take them through to like another level with writing. But they already have to be really, really good or have like that crazy thing happen or be famous, right? With self help, there's a faster arc to teaching someone how to be a better writer, right, Gretchen? It's a lot more of like, is your message clear? Are you, are you being vulnerable? Are you, we can wordsmith a lot of sentences and make everything sound really good, but you don't have to be like brilliant mm -hmm. to write a really good self-help book. You just have to be clear. Okay, so coaches, let's hear a couple of takeaways. You can put them in the chat or you can unmute. What did you get from tonight that you're going to take some action on or think about? Okay. Thank you, Kim, so much. It's been really helpful, everything that you shared. And um, I think my biggest takeaway is my story is kind of like three parts and they're big, they're each big. It's like sobriety, um, then I had a transplant and then infertility. And so when you said like, you can't take people from like down in the gutter to the moon in one book, I'm thinking, I think that's what I've really been struggling with. Like maybe mm -hmm. this is three separate books. Yeah. Um, and I, we've talked, you know, yeah. we've had talks about this too, you know, yeah. and like, Sobriety can definitely be like just a part of who you are if you want to focus on another one of those sections. It doesn't have to be like the, the focus of the book. Mm -hmm. I like that. It's kind of my foundation, so that's been it kind of molds in. Right. Yeah. You're, you're a sober woman writing a book. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Lots of food for that. You're welcome. One more takeaway. I saw Christy's in the chat. Anybody else want to unmute and share theirs? Laura, go ahead. Oh, can you unmute, please? Actually, 
one of my takeaways is because we're, you know, everyone's so busy in life and we have uh, a lot of different things going on. And when uh, Kim said, um, you know, a chapter a week, that kind of hit me like, oh, well, yeah, you don't have to lock yourself in a room and like try to go nuts and try to, you know, write for hours and hours and hours. But a chapter a week was like, huh, it's kind of a little bit of an attainable thing there, you know? Uh, so that resonated with me time-wise because, you know, we all have other things going on, not like floods that, you know, Gretchen has, but stuff, we all have stuff. And it's like, what do I need to give up to do this? But when you put it that way, like a chapter a week, it made me feel like maybe I don't have to give up my other, you know, commitment. Um, so that resonated with me. No, it's very true. And I, most of my clients are type A. So they have a million things going on, yeah. which is why they want to write a book. Right. <laughs> they're, they're type A, right? Right. So, so they are fitting. It's about like six to eight hours. They're trying to chisel out six to eight hours a week. Where am I going to find it? And sometimes it's like one morning less on the Peloton or yeah. like get up an hour earlier or go to the office for two hours on Saturday when no one's there. Like we definitely, like I had a client who flew all the time. He's like, what am I going to do I'm on the plane? I'm like, you can write on planes. I don't, he was like, oh. Sometimes when I don't have time to actually write because things are happening, I speak into my phone as I'm running, you know, my errands. That's great. We're running around and I literally have, you know, that, that I can go home and translate into my journal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, journaling is not the book writing. Journaling is not, I, I'm not pro journaling for any book, book writing experience. I think there's journaling and then there's book writing. They do not go together at all. Okay. Yeah. Good it's to just know. Another, it's just another like kind of procrastination tool. Believe me, I've got 7,000 journals, believe me. Yeah. Um, could have written 40 books by now. I stopped journaling. <laughs> oh, me too. Well, Kim, thank you so much. Um, I will be, you know, putting you in touch with people who ask for contact information and those sorts of things. We really want to thank you for your time and coaches. I'll be seeing you in the coaching for coaches group and in next month's, um, you know, first Wednesday as well, we're going to be talking about better ways to get clients and how to manage your time around it and really how to step into this idea that are you owning the profession or is it a hobby? Because there's really a big thing there that are you owning it? Is this your profession or is it something that you think about? Is it something that's an afterthought? So if it's an afterthought, your bank account's going to show it. And that's why you don't have a lot of clients. If it's your profession, you're going to show up really different. So come next month and we can talk about that. And I look forward to seeing everybody then have a really good month. Thank you. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Everybody. Thank you for your Thank time. You so much. Bye. Yeah.